We'll just uh, have a short prayer again. Dear Heavenly Father, we, as we come before you this evening, Lord, to study your word, we ask, Heavenly Father, uh, that your spirit be upon us, Lord, to help us understand what you have for us tonight, and you protect us, Lord, from human thinking. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to read this evening from the last chapter of the second epistle of Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, um, the first 13 verses. Sorry, 2 Peter, chapter 3, uh, the first 13 verses. In fact, we'll read the whole chapter. Beloved, I now write to you these, this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets, by the holy prophets, and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens of were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which, that, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are, in all that are in it will all be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements which will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, now look for hev new heavens and a new earth in, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, my beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, as also our beloved Paul, a brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the, also the rest of the, scriptures, of, of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall, also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away by the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now, both now and forever. Amen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He promised that he will return, and Peter here tells us he hasn't forgotten, and he's not slack about it. He's going to come. The world we live in makes a lot of what the Bible says look a bit old-fashioned and backward. Uh, Lucy, welcome. I didn't realize you were here tonight. Uh, looks old-fashioned uh, and backwards. And to walk around today with a Bible in your hands, a lot of people look at you and say, you're from the dark ages, there's something wrong with you. Um, and science has made this world that we live in very different to the world that the apostles lived in, and definitely the prophets before them lived in. Uh, and so many things have changed in our lives today that it's hard to keep track of what's happening. It's hard to keep abreast of all the developments that are happening. There's been many inventions. But for me, the most defining moment in my short life, I'm 62, in this world was at primary school that day back in July 1969, the 21st of July in Melbourne, where the three astronauts on the Apollo 11 headed for the moon and that day they landed on the moon and they stepped on the moon and there was all the excitement at school, we're all in this big assembly hall and there's one back then, a massive black and white TV by today's standards 
a, a tiny box when there was you know, two or three hundred students looking at this box, looking at the astronauts stepping onto the surface of the moon. And a lot of us, you know, I was seven years old, nine years old back then, nine years old, um, you know, the concept of man leaving here, traveling 370,000 kilometers to get to the moon and then landing on the surface of the moon, you know, that concept for us was hard, but we couldn't understand what was happening. But over the following days when everything that was in the news about this landing on the moon happened, you know, there's a lot of things that we started asking ourselves. Even then, I was asking myself, wow, this is amazing. I don't know if we can get to Mars and what's that other planet Venus and what if we can get to all these other places. And Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon and he uttered the words which have stood in history, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. A giant leap for every generation since then because NASA managed to put a lot of science into our vocabulary, bring it all into our living room and the, the, the uh, outer space which looked so distant and so far, all of a sudden being so close. And what was demonstrated back then, and has been demonstrated time and time and time again, was that given if man works together as a team with others and they have no problem with money, this teamwork, and on top of that their God-given intellect and inspiration, what seemed to be impossible is now possible. That's what came out of that for me, that's what comes out of that. And since then we've pushed back frontiers in almost every, every direction in terms of you know, technology, in terms of chemistry and physics and biology and medicine, there isn't one area that we haven't pushed back frontiers. When I was going to school, I'd never heard of DNA. Now everyone knows what DNA is and even uh, genetics. I understand a bit about genetics and some read a bit more and they even understand about epigenetics, you know, the latest uh, in, uh, in, uh, in gene technology. And so since then we've pushed back all these different frontiers and some of the advances in our lives have come so fast we haven't had time to breathe and take in the significance of what's been developed and what's been discovered and what's been uh, identified. So fast we haven't been able to take a breath, let alone ask the question, um, how will this change my life? How will this change our lives? Science seems to have leaped over many of the questions that once were asked of it. Questions like, you know, what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to solve? What's the point of this? What, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Even bypass the most important question, which is just because something, just because we can do something, is it the right thing to do? Should we be doing this just because we can do it? <clears throat> and often all of those questions relate to uh, playing God and concepts of that that come up every now and again. But for many of these questions of ethics and morality in science, they're like shackles. You, know, you start questioning, yeah, should we be doing this? Man, go back to your cave. You know, just, just don't worry about it. This is the 21st century. You know, we're doing this because this is what you do with science. This is what science can do. And any questioning of the science uh, produces a lot of scorn. Uh, and you consider it to be backwards and regressive. And so much has been done in science. It's become the new religion for a lot of people. You know, we don't need God anymore. We've got science. God's, uh, science has provided many of the questions that we didn't know. We don't know where we came from. We know possibly how evolution works and all of these things, dare we question the science. So it's not difficult with what's happening today to ask the question or to have many people ask the question, where is God? That's what Peter says here. Where is God? Where is this God? Where is he? Where is he? Why is he taking his sweet time coming? For 2,000 years you've been telling us he's going to come. Where is he? We have science now, we don't really need God. We know all the answers and if there's questions we don't know the answers to, well science in due course will provide the answers to those questions as well. So where is this God of yours? And why is he taking his sweet time coming? Since that is what you believe. And so Peter writes here to the believers to explain a few things to them. And what he explains to the believers here is very important to understand fast dealing with the world in which we live in today. And he says here, right at the beginning, apart from saying I've written to you another epistle, I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. I want to remind you about a few things which are really important. And what he wants to remind them about, he says in verse 2, the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets. You know, Richard Dawkins wants us to listen to the words he speaks today, but Peter says, 
the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets more than 2,000 years ago. And also, and the, commandment, and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. And draw a line there. Listen to us and then draw a line there. Because a lot of things are going to come after. In the previous chapter, it talks about all the false teachers that are going to come. And Scripture tells us about all the antichrists that are going to come and all the different teachings that are going to come and all the things that are going to be presented to us by people that claim to have the truth. And if you look at Second Peter, they have anything but the truth. And so Peter says, draw a line. Whatever you need to know was spoken about by the apostles, or by the prophets, times of old, and by us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he makes this point, not because he's scared that we might read some other things and maybe our minds might be enlightened. That's what a lot of people think. You, know, you just don't want to read just in case you wake up to yourself and you realise this is just a book of myths. That's not why Peter was saying that. Peter was saying that because he knew what was in the human heart. He knew the, the human condition. The sin in man and what sin does to man. And so he tells them to draw a line between what was spoken before, spoken by the apostles, and what's going to come next. Because what's going to come next, he now is going to proceed to tell us. He tells us in verse 3, there's a few things he needs to explain to us. And he says in verse 3, knowing this first, make a note, knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last days. Now the last days for us uh, began when Jesus Christ left this planet and went to the heavens. So we're living in the last days. Now the last days, obviously in God's word, there's the great tribulation that occurs in the last days, there's the coming of Jesus Christ in the last days, and then there's the battle of Armageddon in the last days, and a lot of the judgment of God in the last days. But this period of time, after Jesus Christ departs, we're living in now. We're living in those days. And so Peter says, first thing, take care, scoffers will come, scoffers will come in the last days. People who don't think much of scripture. People that will laugh at you and laugh at scripture. And as I said in the previous chapter, it talks about a lot of these scoffers, the false teachers. So I'm not just talking about people outside who look at Christians and say, hey, they're a bunch of loonies. You know, there's so many different churches make up your mind, you know, what, what, what do you believe? Who, who is God? You know, there's not just talking about the people outside. He's also talking about false teachers, people inside or supposedly inside the church proclaiming to have an understanding of who God is and what Jesus Christ is all about. And they will laugh at the concept that Jesus Christ is coming. Take your time. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. He's been coming for 2,000 years. And there's some denominations who say, oh, he's already come in a spiritual sense, in a metaphysical sense, or I don't understand some of that language. And so they'll dismiss concepts, this concept of the coming of Jesus Christ. Heaven and hell, six foot under, that's it, there's nothing else. The Bible says those places are real. And when Jesus Christ comes, we're going to be confronted, not then to make a choice, then to hear the verdict, then to hear the sentence. Are you a child of God? Is your name written in the book of life? It is. Welcome into eternity in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. Your name is not written in the book of life. Book of life. You get sent to hell. That's a very clear message. It's not a secret message that we have in the word of God. But men are scoffers because they prefer the darkness to the light. And Jesus Christ tells us why in John chapter 3. Because their deeds were evil. And their deeds continue to be evil. And so they prefer the darkness to the light. Evolution has become the new creator. Man does not need God. We don't need to, we won't stand before God because life is just a cycle. We just get, we just come back, our bodies decay, some bacteria eat it, they die, it becomes fodder for some plants which some other person eats, and it just gets all recirculated. They mock the claims of the Bible. And when we look around the world as today, isn't that the shape of the world that we live in? Isn't that the sort of world that we live in? And isn't that sort of thinking, the sort of thinking that maybe we took notice of last week or the week before, whenever it was, when Essendon had to make a decision about who was supposed to be their new president? Scoffers, not interested, couldn't care less, because they have 
other thinking. And so Peter says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days and they will walk according to their own lusts. They will walk according to whatever they think they desire, they want in their lives, and that's what they will pursue. And so the problem here with these scoffers is not an intellectual problem with God. Their problem is a moral problem with God. They don't want to listen to God. They don't want to submit their lives to God. They don't want to consider the fact that maybe one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to have to give an account for my life. It's a moral problem for them. It's not an intellectual problem for them. And so they follow their sinful desires. And they will not... Uh, they're not only from the world around us, they're also from within churches. We have the false teachers, as I said before, in the second chapter, between church, uh, with rising up within churches. And in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 18, we read, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. In other words, if you go back to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 18, they will speak great swelling words. And through these great swelling words of emptiness, which mean nothing, sound nice, but mean nothing, they will allure, they will draw in because they're promoting the lust of the flesh desires. They will draw in people, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in there. Other, even Christians, even those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, will get sucked into this thinking, into this thinking that our desires are most important. Their target is Christians, to draw them away from the truth, appealing to the flesh. And they will be convincing. They have great words, other passages tell us. They will even do wonderful, miraculous signs. So they'll see and they'll think, well, this can't be just anyone. This is someone special. They know what they're talking about. And this thinking and this problem, moral problem that the world has with Christianity today has the effect of telling us, yeah, we don't want to listen to you, just, just shut your mouth. You know, there's a lot of different views and you know, we don't have to put up with your view. Um, and you know, that's why we're often called bigots and intolerant fools and all sorts of other things. But this should not surprise us. 2,000 years ago, God's word said this was going to happen. It says it here in Peter, but also in Romans chapter 1, one of my favourite chapters in the Bible, which tells us how everything is going to unfold through history and we're seeing it unfold very rapidly in our lives today. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 to 23, we read the following. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, that, so that they are without excuse. Man, if he looks to creation, if he looks to nature, if he looks to the world around him, can't escape the fingerprint of God everywhere. Everywhere in creation, Paul tells us, you can see him. He is present. Everything has been created with his mind of artistic thinking, uh, his artistic flair. He's created us, eternal beings, with a creative ability within us. That's how he's created us. You look and you see it. And it says, because also they knew God, they did not glorify him God as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this is the moral problem. They didn't want to recognise God for who he was, nor to thank him for the creation that we have, for who he is. And it says, because of this, their futile minds, their, their hearts and their minds became futile, darkened, and they became foolish in their own thinking. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. We don't worship a lot of those things today. But a lot of denominations sit before an image and they worship an image. And Paul says here, that's what's going to happen because they take their eyes off Jesus Christ, the creator God. And because they do that, all of a sudden darkness sets in and I can't see, they can't understand. So God's word has warned us that this is what man is going to be like. That he's going to pursue not what God wants, but the desires of his heart. And as a result of that, a bit further on in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 and 32, Paul goes on to explain something a bit, further, a bit more in this direction. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want to even think, consider God, understand anything about God, 
They didn't want to retain him in their knowledge. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And he goes on to give us a list of all these terrible things that they're doing which are not fitting. You can't even put into words. God did that. They rejected God. They turned away from God. Rejected having God in their mind, their thinking. And he turned them over to a debased mind. That's what you want. Go for it. Knowing who? Knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. So they know in their minds, in the back of their minds, they know that one day they'll stand before God and they'll give an account and all these things that they're doing that's deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. They don't only do the same as everyone else, but they slap them on the back and say, good on you, you're doing the right thing. And that's the world that we're living in. Anything that's anti-Christian, yeah, it's good. As soon as you say something that has a Christian flavour to it, I have a discussion at work, I can't remember what the topic was, but I remember offering an opinion, and uh, there's a bunch of strangers, and the person turned around and said, are you a Christian? In other words, that's what you expect from a Christian. They're backwards in their thinking. Yeah. God says, that's what happens in the world. When you turn away from God and you reject God and your knowledge, your heart becomes darkened, and you can't think straight. And so these scoffers, it says, will come in the last days, they will walk according to their own lusts, and they will say, what will they scoff about? They will scoff about the Lord's coming. Why will they do that? It tells us, for since the beginning, uh, for since, the, in verse 4, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will fully forget. Why do they do that? Why well, they scoff and mock? Because it's something that they willfully forget. They make an effort to forget, to push out of their minds. This is what God's word says. They willfully forget. Where has he been for 2,000 years? The Apostle Paul. Paul's gone. Where is he now? Where is Jesus Christ? It's Jesus Christ you're talking about. Where is he? The reason that is offered today is not because there's an intellectual problem, as we said earlier. The problem is because they want to willfully forget something. And Peter here tells us what it is, in verse 5 he starts, what it is that they want to willfully forget. They willfully forget that the word of God, but that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Right from the beginning, creation began because God spoke it into existence. There was nothing. The Big Bang got something right. There was nothing, and all of a sudden there was something. And it was God who said, let there be light, and he created the heavens and the earth. And there it was. It was there from the beginning. And by that same word of God, the heavens and the earth were created. So our world was spoken to existence by God. And then it says, uh, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. And we go back to Genesis and we get understanding, a bit of an understanding of what this means. It was this soup of something or other, and God separated, it says, the dry ground from the waters. He separated the land from the waters. So the earth was void and without form, and God drew up the land, and that's the land that we can stand on today and live on today. And he formed it specifically and, and exactly for our existence. So this was done by the word of God. And he goes on to say, <clears throat> in verse 6, but which the world that then existed perished being flooded by water. So this, God, this heavens and the earth that God spoke into existence and the earth that he formed specifically for us, this is the same earth that God destroyed with the great flood in Noah's time. It perished in Noah's time. And Peter says this not because he wants to give us a history lesson, but he says right from the start because he wants to remind us of a few things. And what he wants to remind us of, well, we read that, why God destroyed the heavens and the earth. Back in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, just before God spoke to Noah, he said to Noah, I've had enough. This is what he said. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. This is Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He looked, he saw the wickedness of man, and he saw within man's heart and his thoughts 
they were continuously evil. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God had put up with a lot. And he put up for a lot for a long time. And at some point, uh, the line was crossed. And the Lord said, enough is enough. And he destroyed the world by water. And he made a promise after that, they would never destroy the world by water again. And so in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, we read, And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. And so in Noah's time, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, warning people to repent, to get into the ark, to escape the coming judgment. But they laughed at Noah. And so Noah and his family were saved. Now Peter tells us, God spoke the world into existence. He formed it with his words to be a place that we can live in. And then the same God destroyed it by water because of man's sinfulness. So this is like Peter pointing to us and saying, you're hearing what God is saying here? He spoke, he did, he destroyed it, he did. And then he goes on to say that that same word which spoke the world to existence back then and then destroyed it by water. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word. So now he's preserving the world by the same word. The same word that's spoken to existence and then destroyed it by water is sustaining life and preserving life with his word. It's his will that this world still exists. The world is not going to self-destruct or die from climate change or some nuclear war, some other global catastrophe. Uh, many movies about that, you know, the day after and uh, um, Deep Impact and I'm not sure some of the other movies. A lot of movies about end times and the uh, God, um, nature destroying the world. Well, it's not going to die because God's preserving it. Peter tells us here it's going to be preserved. And if anyone's going to do any damage to it, it's going to be God. And he tells us that he has reserved it. Verse 7, for, uh, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. If anyone's going to exercise judgment in this world to destroy this world, it's not going to be man, it's going to be God. God has preserved it for that, for that judgment. And when it's time, he'll judge it, he'll destroy it with fire. If there's any destruction that's going to happen, it will be done by God. And not only the heavens and the earth will be destroyed by fire, but the whole universe as we know it will disappear. He's spoken to existence, he's going to take it out. And then he's going to create, he tells us a bit later on, a new heavens and a new, a new earth. And this is what man willfully forgets. He does not want to remember this part of what God says to him today. The warning from God has been there for 2,000 years. From Old Testament times, God spoke of the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord. You go through the prophets, and there's many references to the day of the Lord. Paul says in Romans 1.18, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It's coming. It's being stored up. God is waiting, and it will happen. And yet man turns a blind eye to all these warning warnings that God gives and he scoffs and he mocks what God where is he what's he why is he taking his sweet time and man doesn't see the coming judgment as the big issue in his life today you know what are the big issues in our lives today what are the big issues climate change and all the green ideology that comes with it all the intolerance and bigotry that hurts people that's a, that's a huge moral problem today isn't it and what about rewriting all the wrongs of the past and rewriting our history and then you know, creating a new history because we want to wipe out certain things, willfully neglect, forget certain things and not remember the bad things of history so we don't repeat them again in the future. And equality for everyone, except for white males, you would have heard. It was this year or late last year at some school. A big fuss because the teachers or some group of teachers got the male students to stand up and to apologise to the women because they were male. A you know, huge problem, huge, terrible problem. These are the biggest moral challenges of our time, really. 
This is what we are supposed to be worried about today. And not the gender-bending ideology destroying the minds of innocent children and all the other rubbish that comes with it and offends and sickens God. And at some point, God will say, you crossed the line. He said it back in Genesis. He's going to say it again. And what do we expect to happen to our world when we turn our back on God? What can man expect to happen to the world? I'm not saying all of us are doing that. But this is a world that we live in where a lot of people have turned their backs on God. Not sure how many of you have caught up with the CRISPR babies. Anyone heard of the CRISPR babies? So there's a, I shouldn't mention the race because I might offend some people. Back in November 2018, a scientist uh, reported at a conference that he managed to edit uh, the embryos, uh, human embryos, before implanting them, they were single cell embryos, before implanting them to remove a particular gene, the CC, CCR5 gene, I think, uh, which predisposes you to being able to be infected by the HIV virus. Okay, so he thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we can create people which don't get infected with the HIV virus? And so he used this particular technology, which is very common in a lot of labs, including ours at work, to edit the embryo, to get rid of this gene, so that these babies would be born, you implant them, and then they're born, and they don't have the, uh, the CCR5 gene. And so I can't remember how many, I think it was eight or seven or eight couples that he did it with, and he showed them some sort of fake ethical papers that he had from his institute to do it. And three kids were born, Amy and twins, Lulu and Nana. And both were born, uh, all were born rather, with edited DNA. And so he reported these findings at a conference in 2018. There was a huge uproar. What are you doing? You've crossed every possible conceivable ethical barrier. How can you possibly do this? He thought he was doing the humanity a favour. You know, we're going to be able to edit. And the technology isn't precise. So there are these three babies now. They were wondering, what do we do? the guy was imprisoned and his associates were imprisoned. Uh, I think they're out now and they paid a huge fine. But now they have the other problem. I've got these three kids now. What do we do with them? And so this guy comes back and says, why don't we build a research institute so we can study what happens to them? Now, you have to ask yourself, how does this escape all, all morality that whatever remnant of morality exists in people the man can not only turns his back on God but he starts acting like God and doing only what God can do and instead of stopping to listen to the warning of God man still continues in rebellion you know all the big moral challenges of our time and not thinking about the coming judgment last week I'm not sure it was this week you would have heard the news about a major accomplishment from NASA. Anyone hear about it? No? You don't read your papers, the news? NASA accomplishes a space mission. There's this asteroid, circulating, a small asteroid, 150, 160 metres diameter, circulating around a bigger asteroid, it's like the moon of a bigger asteroid, somewhere very far out in space. And they decided we should try something just in case an asteroid is coming to earth you know this is a deep, deep impact movie type scenario just in case this asteroid is coming to earth they decided we should try and target this and see if we can deflect the orbit of an asteroid so if it does happen we can save the world okay good idea so they decided they found this asteroid and back in november 2021 10 months ago nasa launched uh, their the rocket, the spacecraft, the ship, and they called it Double Asteroid Redirection Test, uh, which really stands for DART, which we understand. DART, and they launched it 10 months ago. It was about the size of a fridge, and they're shooting it off into space. Uh, John Hopkins University was involved with this. He applied physics laboratory. They built DART. They cost them around 325 US million US dollars, about half a billion Australian dollars, to create this thing and to shoot it off to this asteroid, which was, let me get the right, uh, uh, 11 million kilometers away. And they picked something that was far just in case it deflected the orbit, and I'm, I'm joking, just in case it headed towards Earth. Yeah, that was, had another problem. This asteroid was called Dimorphos, and they hit the asteroid September the 26th this year, two and a half, three weeks ago. And it took a while for the photos to come back 
and for the calculations to be done to see have we moved, changed the orbit of this asteroid. And uh, they were very excited. It was 11 million kilometers away. Uh, and this uh, spacecraft DART was traveling 22 and a half thousand kilometers an hour to get to hit it. And with their final calculations, they realized that uh, they calculated that they changed the orbit around the, the big asteroid it was circulating around. They shortened it by 32 minutes. You know, it took 11 hours or whatever it was to go around its planet, and they shortened it by 32 minutes. And you know, this is an amazing feat. Right? Just leave aside why they did this. This is an amazing feat. To be able to target something that far away and to hit it is amazing. That's God-given intellect. The philosophy behind it is demonic. All right? So you know, we're going to save the planet because we're going to destroy an asteroid 11 million kilometers away. And this is what NASA said. This strategy could protect the planet from incoming asteroids or comets. One small shift, now notice the play on language here, right? One small shift in a space rock's trajectory could some, could someday mean one giant sigh of relief for human mankind, all right? Neil Armstrong's uh, words. Uh, if, so, yeah, if, if we can push it off course, we might save collision with Earth. The impact shortened the asteroid's orbit by about 30 minutes. It was successful. Um, you know, we could potentially deflect a space rock at some point in the future. And NASA went on to say, we conducted humanity's first planetary defense test. And we showed the world that NASA is ser a serious defender of this planet. God's preserved it, reserved it for judgment by fire, he's going to destroy it. And that there's playing marbles in the sky with some asteroid who knows where. And they think we're doing so much. If an Earth-threatening asteroid was discovered and we could see it far enough away, this technique could be used to deflect it. NASA is trying to be ready for whatever the universe throws at it. You have to laugh. An asteroid. God's saying, I'm going to destroy it by fire. And you're worried about a rock circulating through the universe. You have to laugh. God has reserved the heavens and earth for destruction by fire. And NASA gets excited because I can shift a rock. Meanwhile, the prophets and the apostles cry out through the ages for man to put his eyes, focus his eyes on the fact that this world is preserved for judgment. Not to scare man, but to help him understand yet time is going to be up soon. In Second Peter we read in this chapter, sorry I'll just read it from Isaiah first, from the prophets. Come now, God says to the people, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good fruit of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It couldn't be any simpler than that. Come, let us reason together. Why should you die in your sin? Come and be forgiven. Come and receive salvation in Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, judgment is waking, waiting. This world will be destroyed by fire. And that's not the big problem. The big problem is we're eternal beings, and after that we're going to stand before God. And how are we going to face God? We can't hide in a cave. The world will be gone. We're going to stand before God. Hebrews tells us, Paul, the author of Hebrews, I call him Paul, but the author of Hebrews tells us, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So the real issue for man is how are we going to face the day of the Lord? How are we going to face this day? And Peter tells us here, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. We read that verse, verse 10. It will not be a global catastrophe, or the woke agenda that destroys our world, God tells us, tells us how it will be destroyed. Human history will end with judgment. The world was never designed to last forever. It was designed to be destroyed because God had his plans to make a new heaven and a new earth. And Peter doesn't tell us all these things to make us fear and despair, but to prepare. And that's why he says to the Christians right at the start, I stir up your minds by way of reminder that you should... Be mindful of the words that were spoken earlier. This is going to happen. And the call for you to come and be, be saved 
That call still exists today. Hebrews again tells us, today, if you hear, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And that was the message of the apostles in Acts, Peter's sermon. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men, brethren, what shall we do? That Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And, as, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Now the scoffers may ask, what's the hold up? Where is he? That's an important question for Christians as well. Why is he taking his sweet time? Well, Peter tells us here why he's taking his time. And he tells us he's not taking his time because he's got a few other things to tick off, some other universe somewhere else. Not because there's some bickering between some of the angels and he's going to sort some of those issues out. He tells us here in verse 9, the most important verse in this chapter, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, repent, to repentance. He is waiting. He doesn't want any man to go to hell. He doesn't want any woman to go to hell. He's waiting, and he's waiting for all to come to repentance. Jesus Christ could have come years ago. He could have come a week after he was ascended into the heavens. But he's waiting. He's waiting for you and me. He's waiting for people to understand their sinfulness and come to him and receive salvation from him. He's waiting for mankind to come to his senses. God hasn't destroyed the world, not because he's slack, not because it's a brilliant work of creation, it is, but because he waits for man to come to him with a repentant heart. And that, I think, to me, shows how loving and merciful and graceful our God is that he's patient with us, patient with those who call themselves Christians to mature in their walk and not to play around with God, patient with those who don't know Jesus Christ personally yet as their personal saviour, waiting for them to come to him and receive salvation for himself. And the question for us is, what are you waiting for? Judgment has been reserved. He's preserving the world for judgment, for destruction and then judgment after that. What are you waiting for? Don't get too excited about all the movements happening in the world to try and save the planet. We need to be responsible. I'm not saying we shouldn't be responsible with what we do in our lives. But look in anticipation to the coming of the Lord because that's what makes a difference in our lives. On the way down to church, I was held up in traffic and I was listening to this particular hymn from Dallas Home from many years ago. Who remembers Dallas Home? We're showing our age. To a world of fear and darkness came a light as bright as day with a song of love and words of kindness he came to show the way though his face was not recorded nor the color of his skin but his words rolled out upon the darkness and touched the hearts of men and the people called him jesus what a wonderful name jesus is and the invitation to us don't worry the planet Worry about your soul. Me to worry about my soul. Because that's what's important in life. May God bless his word. And give to each of us more according to the needs that we have. I just want to close with a prayer. And then we'll sing our song. I'll have a bit of time of prayer afterwards. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, Lord, to thank you, Lord, that you're not slack concerning your promise, but you're waiting, Lord waiting for us, waiting for people, because you don't want to see anyone in hell. Unfortunately, Lord, we're reading your word that many will end up there, but you don't want to see us in hell. And we thank you, Lord, for your patience. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you give us like tonight to look into your word and to come to our senses and to recognize we're not here forever, but eternity is forever. And we need to prepare for eternity. We thank you for this and we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.